Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America. This episode is brought to you by the Tennessee Department of Tourist Development. Visit tnvacation.com to start planning your next trip to Tennessee. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emma, before I introduce our very special guest today, what's something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, Scott, this week I discovered that the reproduction of the Wright Brothers aircraft hanging above the lower level of the military gallery was actually constructed by over 100 students from the local high school. See, I love that you picked that one. Um, One of my favorite things about Discovery Park of America is that it was a community project that people from all walks of life got involved in what we do. And so um, it's really an exciting a uh, vibrant place thanks to the people of our community. So my very special guest today is Ed Sargent. He is our very first Grammy nominated producer here on our podcast. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So you've had um, a fascinating career um, and um, you've done some really, really uh, interesting things that we're going to get into. Um, but first, tell me a little bit about uh, where you started out. Where, where are you from and, and how did you get interested in music? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm born and bred in West Tennessee. I'm from Bolivar, a little town um, south of Jackson here in West Tennessee. Went to high school there, junior high, was uh, part of the marching band program, symphonic band programs. Very fortunate to have some great um, people in my life that influenced me at an early age to follow the path of music. One of them being Joe Sills, who unfortunately just passed of COVID, but a very influential band director in West Tennessee that that influenced a lot of students. Bill Bradford was also my director. But, you know, just uh, my love for music uh, in the very beginning, took me down uh, that path that led me to UT Martin. Um, Had a great teacher there, uh, Nancy Matheson, who was uh, one of my life mentors as well as a musical coach, and um, really kind of set the stage for the rest of my career. I I started in Martin the fall of 1977 and was there through 1982 and had the the opportunity to really – study with some great instructors. They had great instructors there at the time, as which they do now. But uh, uh, just uh, had had the opportunity to, to work with some outstanding people that were not only, they didn't only teach you notes on the page. They taught you about daily life and, and, and learning time management and, and things that were very important for, for, you know, somebody at my age that was just getting out and getting out into the world and it was great. Yeah. I'm from West Tennessee and, and uh, uh, happy to have had the opportunity to go to UTM. Were your parents uh, musically inclined? Not at all. Not at all. Um, yeah. Uh, my aunt was a great piano player, played by ear. She inspired me at a, an early age. Her name's Peggy Wilson. Um, and I knew as a kid that I wanted to be a drummer. My grandmother, who was uh, far beyond her, her years, um, in terms of just being able to inspire all of all of us kids she used to let me sit on the floor with two wooden handle wooden handle spoons and play on some pots and pans and i knew i knew when i was five years old that i wanted to be a drummer and i wanted to play music wow that's incredible um and so so you're you're looking to see you know you're a senior i'm assuming you played in the band and and in high school you they probably saw your talent and you got to do a lot of things like that is that right Exactly. Yeah. I was a soloist uh, with the, the high school band um, in the symphonic band and uh, Anthony D'Andrea, who was the band director at the time at UT Martin, uh, came in and did a, re- a rehearsal with us prior to going to a competition. Um, you know, you bring in guest conductors and they kind of see and do things that your normal conductor doesn't normally do. And um and he got to hear me play and he, he came off and says, where are you going to school? And I said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. It's like, well, 
you know, consider coming to UTM. And I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it, but um, this was my 11th grade year. And then all my senior year, he just kept in touch like a good recruiter does, you know, it's like, you know, we want you to come, we want you to come. I'm, and, and the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, I mean, uh, and then Joe Hodge, who was the percussion section leader at the time, you know, he was in touch with me and I, th I felt like, you know, you, you always want to go somewhere where they want you. And um, so, um, so I decided to go to UTM. It was one of the best decisions of my life. That's incredible. And it's also uh, really interesting that, you know, they went out into the world. If they hadn't have been going out and, and working in high schools like that, you might not have ever even thought about UTM. I would have never went. No, no, I, I never would have. Um, I thought I was a good player. Um, I, I, I didn't become a great player until I went to UTM. Um, and it had to do with uh, Nancy Madison and the great, you know, when uh, all ships rise with the tide, you know, kind of thing. But I was like a lot of local musicians that were, you know, maybe been the best drummer in their class, but you get there and you, you hear some really fine musicians and it makes you up your game. So, and that's exactly what happened there. And so you um, were at UTM and uh, excelled. Did you know really what you wanted to do with your degree and with your skills when post-college? Not a clue. Not <laughs> a clue. And I don't mind telling you this. And, and I, t I tell the students when I go back and do master classes at the university. One of the, the things that I think is very important for young students to know is not get caught up in, in the money aspect of it. For me, the first time I ever got on a, a school bus and took a band trip, I thought that was the most fun that you could have. Well, you're, you're, the camaraderie of being with all the musicians. We're going to play a gig. That gig may have been the, the, the Christmas parade in Savannah, you know, or, or the, the Paris French Fish Fry or the Humboldt Festival. You know, I, just taking a band trip to me was always the most fun thing that we could do. And... I really knew then that, and, and I didn't see the bigger picture at the time, but I wanted to travel. You know, I, w I wanted to be in the music business and I wanted to travel. Even when I was going to school, I, I was getting an education. Uh, I was in a music ed major, but we got to travel a lot with the marching band, symphonic band, percussion ensemble, corollaires, things like that. And I always loved the most part of it. Uh, the, what I loved the most about it was just getting to travel. So, um, but I didn't really foresee the end result until um, we had a guest artist come in uh, for the guest artist series there at UT Martin, and his name was Stan Mark. And we, we want, he played with the band Maynard Ferguson's orchestra, and we wanted to get Maynard Ferguson's band in, couldn't really get them in, couldn't afford them. Um, but we were able to get Stan Mark, and I was instrumental in bringing him in. He and I became very good friends and one of my uh, life mentors as well and opened the door for my future. And that's what, uh, that's what really led me to go on the road five days after I got my degree uh, at UTM. I was sitting on a tour bus in Hollywood, California, and that led <laughs> to a 25-year um uh, uh, a career that that's still going on. But the point I wanted to make was with the kids that I, I didn't, I I've, I've been fortunate to make a ton of money, but that wasn't the impetus for what I was doing. I found my passion. You know, once you find your passion in life, it's very important to follow that road instead of the, the instead of following the dollars and cents, Once you find your passion in life, the money will come. It just will. And um, that's that's the point I try to make to all the students when I go back and have the opportunity to talk to them or the high school students that I, I get chance to speak with. And it's so interesting that you um, that you had a that you loved being on the bus, you know, going anywhere, even if it was a small gig. You know, you love the camaraderie and you just kept doing that. And then it led to, you know, success doing that because of the passion. Exactly. Exactly. And A, this was my favorite band. We were, we had a couple of really good trumpet players at UT Martin and Maynard Ferguson was a high note trumpet specialist and, 
you know, very popular at the time. He had the hits on uh, Gonna Fly Now from Rocky and Conquistador and Chameleon. I mean, he had, a, he had a lot of great hits and he was very popular in instrumental music programs around the world. And we, uh, we did a, like a, uh, a Maynard Ferguson field show in our jazz band. We played about six, six or eight of his charts. So I wanted to see him live. And the only way that I could really do that is try to inspire some kind of movement through the school to catch him, you know, uh, and bring him in. And, and what really kind of got me the call to come out and do the job was after we brought Stan Mark in uh, when I was a junior, uh, he and I became good friends. I kept up with him and he kind of mentored me on how to book the band. He's like, you know, don't, don't call a booking agent and, and, you know, just try to get a bump, catch us coming out of one place into another where we're close, do it on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. You can get the band for a song and dance and you know, we'll do a back end uh, percentage on the date. So, so we can get together. You know, it was more about the hang at that point because we inducted him into Phi Me Alpha Symphony of the Music Fraternity as an honorary. So he, he loved coming back and hanging with us anyway. So, um, so that's what I did. And uh, in my senior year, in April of, of 82, we caught the band coming from Knoxville to Little Rock. It was a perfect layout. I couldn't have planned it any better. So we, we, we got him for, you know, not their top dollar. And we built a back end percentage into the structure of the deal. And we sold five and eight dollar tickets. And through the university, we used their marketing program and was able to get the word out to all these high schools, all the high schools in the area. And it, it started out in Harriet Fulton uh, Auditorium, where you know they're at UTM. And we ended up moving it over to the field house. We ended up selling about 43, 4,400 tickets. And the band ended up making more on the percentage back end than they did on the guarantee. I come out smelling like a rose. <laughs> I, I had no idea it was going to be this successful, but it, it was. And um, so they took me back, uh, the, the tour manager at the time, Bruce Galloway, who I ended up spending 16 years on the road with. He took me back to, to me Maynard after the gig, you know, and um, yeah, this is, you know, this is our guy. And, um, Maynard, Maynard was gracious and, and wonderful, um, uh, and he welcomed me in, and, and then he says, uh, so, yeah, when you're getting out of school? I said, you know, well, I'm, you know, I take my last final in six weeks, a month or so. He's like, well, what are you doing after that? I said, I'm coming to work with you. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, he's a big laugh, and I, I laugh big, and yeah. So, and, and that was it. So I left his dressing room, and then I get a call, like I said, uh, four days after my last final, I get a call from Stan Mark. He says, I just fired the Maynard's valet. I'm like, good. What does that mean for me? He says, can you fly to LA tomorrow? I'm like, you damn right I can. <laughs> and um, went out in, to um, the Playboy Jazz Festival at the Hollywood Bowl in 1982. And that started uh, my career that uh, I, I, I was hired on as his valet, personal assistant. Um, and then two years after I did that job, I, I moved into the tour manager job and I was 24 years old and uh, I was with him till then. So you, so you um, left Martin, Tennessee. Yeah. Um, and in like five days after you graduated, who were some of the jazz greats that you were suddenly thrown into the world with? Oh, my God. Well, at that particular festival alone, uh, Miles was there. Uh, Bill Cosby was the MC. Um, Spire Chira, Dizzy Gillespie's All Star Big Band, <coughs> George Benson, and, and a lot of these these uh, artists I ended up working with through the course of my career. Because out with Maynard's band, he had a um, he had a thirteen piece band, eleven piece was his traveling band. And then when we did like a jazz explosion package where we would use Maynard's core band, but then have other invited guests to come with us, I always got to expand the band. So I had the opportunity to work on these jazz explosion tours with, with a variety, Marlena Shaw, 
Alani Liston Smith, Dizzy. Once we did uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Joe Williams, uh, Lonnie Liston Smith, Marlena Shaw, um, uh, just just a, a, a ton of different people that that were all my heroes that I'd listened to through college. And then we would do jazz festivals all around the world. We, we would usually spend six weeks at a time in Europe over the summer, going from one major festival to the next, you know, through the Montreux Festival, um, you know, to the, the, the great festivals in Japan. Um, and then and in working with those festivals, you got to see all of your friends on the other bands as well. Woody Herman's band, uh, Buddy Rich's big band, you know, which we shared the stage a lot with those guys. So it was really a, a, a talk about camaraderie in a musical setting. It was it was just amazing um, to get to hang with everybody and travel like that with that band. And there is a there is an energy it's almost indescribable that goes on amongst the crew and the performers, the backstage family, you know, while the energy, you know, is going on from the audience and, you know, and there's just something about all that that's hard to explain. It really is. Um, it really is, but it, it's all a part of the equation. It, it's, it's getting to the gig a couple hours early you know, sharing that backstage space with other artists and getting ready for your time to be on the stage. And that's what, what makes it so special is that camaraderie. And, you know, it's, it's instant gratification for musicians. And that's why it's been so tough during the COVID, you know, we're so used to, 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 to go in and the energy to do a show and then walking out on stage and wah, and then you come off the stage and everybody's up and, feeling good about, you know, the gig and, 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 the, and the performance and the audience. And then you go on to the next town. Well, I mean, for a year now, none of us have had that now, across the board, you know, and I think everybody in the music business is so ready to get back out and sink their teeth back into the life that we knew for so long. Yeah, I think there's going to be a resurgence of live performance <laughs> after this because people want to people want to hear it. And the, the performers and the the crew, everybody wants to get back to to what we knew before. Absolutely. Um, what is what does uh, for somebody who's completely clueless? You know, everybody sees the performer and they see the the end result. What does? But they don't know that behind the scenes there are people who are tour managers who are putting it all together. What? How would you describe the life of a tour manager? What does a tour manager do? Hmm. Well, um, it's kind of like herding cats uh, <laughs> on, on a lot of days. Um, it's a it's it's the best job in the world when things are going great. And it's the worst job. I mean, you're the first person that gets called when there's a problem. So you're always standing by your phone waiting to deal with whatever. It's a bus breakdown, or or you got a sick guy in the crew, or or the drummer loses a tooth. Or, or something like that. I mean, you're, you're basically the guy that, that you're going to get the call and it's up to you to, to, to make the show go on. But a typical day, you know, for me as a tour manager, I deal with the personnel um, in a management position, just like, you know, very similar to your, your job there at the Discovery Park. It's, it's a matter of getting the best people that you can around you, trusting your crew people, your artists, which you have artists and crew, just like I do in, in the fact that, um, for me, it's about getting people safely from point A to point B, make sure that the musicians don't have to worry about the skinny things in life, like hotel check-ins or transportation to and from the gig and making sure they get fed well, uh, and making sure that, everything runs smooth. So all they have to think about is the music. If, if, if they get to that stage and everything in their day is ran smoothly, that all they have to think about is getting on that stage and playing good music and putting on a good show for that audience. The tour manager has done his job. And I always look at, at that, you know, no matter what the, the difficulties are through the course of the day, or that bring me to that point in the day, it's all worth it 
when that band is smiling right before they go on stage and that walk on music is going on. And I, you know, I work with Joan Jett now and when Joan can look at her band and she's feeling good, the band's feeling good and they take the stage and they put put, put on a great show. I've done my job. And that's kind of, yeah. you know, that's it. I've noticed that uh, a lot of times, like the the relationship between the performer and the tour manager goes on just with the eyeballs. Um, you know, a t- I think a performer feels better if they see their tour manager right over there so that when things go south, all they got to do is look at you. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a comfort level there um, in, in knowing that, you know, I got your back, you know, I'm there for you. I, I have your back. And the same thing with Maynard. Maynard Ferguson as well, you know, in being on the side of the stage, <coughs> you never know what's going g- going to happen. You know, I got crew guys. If a cymbal falls off of a cymbal stand, if a guitar cord gets wrapped around, you know, somebody's feet or a leg or a cameraman gets too close, you know, something like that. But in terms of the artist walking on that stage, you, that's that's my main that's my main focus during the show. And that's getting her on the stage, getting her off the stage, back to the dressing room safely um, is, is, you know, it's a part of, it's a very big part of it for sure. I mean, would you say, I mean, I've, I felt like in the past that, that the entertainer in some ways is a commodity and that they have been hired to do a certain gig and that oftentimes people will push the envelope way beyond what the agreement was. And it's up to the tour manager to manage the situation versus the artist having to be the bad guy. The artist is never the bad guy. I can just clarify that right now. And if, if they have to be, then the tour manager's not doing his job. For me, I, I try, and I, I stress this also in my master classes to the kids. The most important thing that you can do before the show is advance the job correctly. So the day of the show, you know exactly what you're walking into. You know the exactly the parameters of the request that you have agreed to and anything outside of that is a surprise. And I make it it perfectly clear to the buyers, even the guys that I love that I've worked with for years, they know that on the day of the show, don't bring a guitar for Joan to sign because it's not going to happen. Don't plan a photo shoot for Joan 20 minutes before she goes on stage because it's not going to happen. I have a, a very detailed list from the moment my crew walks onto the deck of the stage till we are on the bus pulling out of the parking lot. That, that pretty much covers every, every possible scenario. And I give the, 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 the buyer the opportunity, you know, where, what are your requests? You know, and we'll entertain reasonable requests because we're there as a guest. And this is a working relationship that we have with them through this eight or nine hour period. And we want to be good guys. We want to be uh, 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 good participants as they want to be good hosts, but you have to find that middle ground, but you have to find it before the day of the show. Nothing comes up on the day of the show, you know, and it basically it's, it's easy at that point because I'm not a bad guy. You know, we didn't talk about this. No, we did not discuss this. This was not approved by artists. And I always have the beauty of management. Management did not approve this. Everything goes up. At, at, outside of a, 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 a normal day working relationship, anything outside of what we determine as a normal day has to be approved by management. And if it becomes a problem, then the buyer goes back to the booking agent who booked the gig and they make him earn his percentage by making him go to management and say, can you get Joan to do this? Can you get Maynard to do this? Um, because I, I'll, I'll basically put it on the, the booking agents because that's their job. You know, and, and it's not my job to approve it. It's my job to, if they have that request that goes outside of the boundaries of the tour manager's responsibility, I'll put it right back on the head of the, the, the booking agent because that's what he gets paid for. And, um, uh, and, and let them fight it out. That's their battle. And, and as you mentioned, um, 
one thing that you and I have in common is that while you work for the queen of rock and roll, there was a time where I worked for the king of rock and roll. I know. And, I love that. Yeah. So, so we're, we're, you know, we're in a very small fraternity. Yeah. Um, I, I do know that. So we got to work with a lot of people, you know, who came in and the best tour managers would oftentimes say, where will they walk? You know, like if they wanted to walk the walk, Sure. That the that the entertainer was going to walk ahead of time to make sure you know that that the entertainer was not surprised. I think the biggest right. in the most important thing was no surprises. So exactly, exactly, and that's at the very bottom of my advance sheet. That's <laughs> that's the last thing that I tell the 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 buyer who's bringing us in that I, I'll take every call that you want to make to me. If we're two months out and you want to call me every day until this show happens, I'll take your calls. And that's how we eliminate no surprises on the day of the show. And also, yes, that, that walk to the stage, that's done with myself and, and one crew guy and the security guy that we always have security, dressing room security. And we do this walk before I ever take Joan to the stage or before I ever took Maynard to the stage. It's the path that, that we go. Oftentimes, you know, when you're playing, say, a private show in a hotel ballroom, um, and it's, it's a private event, and you've got multiple elevators, or you have to go backstairs, backstage through a kitchen, things like that. Those things you have to you you have to advance on day on the day of the show. You have to know what you're getting into and making sure that she's not going through a public area and things like that. That sometimes they don't think about, but you 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 better not get caught with your pants down and and end up and she's in you know walking through a room with a hundred people prior to the show right and i think um you know you as the tour manager very much make a mental note and remember when the venues throw you a curveball um when it's time to book gigs again you remember those places always <laughs> Speaking of Lake Charles, Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> so when we get back, uh, we, we've talked about Joan Jett a couple of times. When we get back from the break, I'm going to ask you uh, to tell us a little bit more um, about how that came about. Looking for a family-friendly vacation destination? Visit Tennessee for the mountains, the music, the rivers, the food, the attractions, and so much more. Visit TNVacation.com to start planning today. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. It helps us get the word out about the great things we're doing here in West Tennessee. Our guest today is Ed Sargent. Um, we're, we're exchanging uh, stories on uh, the rock and roll business and um, as we discussed before the break, uh, you are um, the tour manager for Joan Jett, uh, who is known worldwide as the queen of rock and roll. Um, she's had an incredible career, uh, a trailblazer. Um, how, how did you get hooked up with Joan? Um, it's kind of funny how that, that came about. The booking agency that I worked with for many, many years called Paradise Artists, they also booked Maynard Ferguson's band, who I was tour managing for many, many years. Bill Minot, Howie Silverman, Bob Burke, and those guys. And they book a lot of people. Um, uh, and once Maynard died in 2006, I took some time off the road. I went and worked for Steve Shankman and uh, with Contemporary Productions in St. Louis. But, and I was contemplating, you know, maybe getting off the road and doing some private events and things like that with Steve and, and his group. And then I was sitting out in the middle of the Tennessee River near Savannah fishing with my dad. And I got a call from, from by, uh, Bill Minot. He says, Ed, man, um, do you want to come back out on the road? I said, well, I haven't given much thought. He says, well, um, I booked Joan Jett and the Black Arts, which I knew. And uh, he says, uh, they're going out and doing a tour with Aerosmith, but they don't have a tour manager. And, and I was like, well, why not? And he says, this is a long story. I'll tell you about it sometime. But I, I was like, well, when does the tour start? He says, 
Well, pretty soon, you know, vague, like every uh, booking agent in the world. Um, and I was like, could you possibly be more vague? He's like, well, it starts pretty soon. I'm like, you booked the dates. When does it start? He's like, okay, it starts in two weeks. I'm <laughs> like, well, what's been done, you know, as they booked any hotel? He says, no, n- you know, nothing's really been done. So I was like, well, it still sounds like fun. I, I was always uh, a fan of Jones, and and I was also a fan of Aerosmith, who I loved. Of course, I grew up in that era. So uh, I said, well, let me get out of the water. So I went back, hooked up a call with him and Kenny Laguna, Jones' manager, partner, piano player in the band. It's like, um, yeah, let's give this a shot. You know, we need some help here. Um not much has been done with regards to the tour, uh, long story with a previous tour manager, et cetera. Um, but they we're kind of behind the eight ball. It's like, can you come to New York? Sure. When? Tomorrow. Okay. So I basically left my cabin at the river, went to Memphis, packed, and flew to New York the next day. And, um, my buddy is like my, my one of my very best friend, Carl Fisher. He plays trumpet with uh, Billy Joel's band. He lives out in Rock near Rockville Center, which is close to where Joan lived. I went and stayed at his house for 10 days, uh, 13 days, something like that, and pretty much sit at his kitchen table <clears throat> and put the tour together. It was a three and a half week tour, booked all the hotels. Uh, pulled in some favors from my guy who owns a bus company, Senators Coaches down in Florence, and uh, got us a bus, got got the hotels, got all the flights booked, and and started with John. Our first date in Chicago, uh, flew in, and, you know, that's the first time I met her was at the first show um, in the afternoon. I, I flew in, uh, and it was, uh, you know, I, I instantly loved Joan. Um, just her energy and her vibe and, and her band, um, it was different. It was such a, a, a complete 180 from what I'd done musically before. I've been in jazz for, you know, 25 years. Um, and I'd always wanted to do a rock and roll tour. So I was like, well, yeah, I give it a shot. You know, I may dig it. I may not, you know, but you, you, you never say no to a gig that you could possibly learn a lot on. And I did. So, I went out and um, I was just hired specifically for the tour, you know, for this one tour, which really it, it, it kind of saved both of us. You know, it's like I'm not doing a long term commitment. They're not doing a long term. Let's see how we get out and do it. So we get about a week into it and everything's going pretty good. And then um, I talked to Kenny Laguna. He's like, you know, uh, after this, we're going to Europe with. Motorhead, Alice Cooper and Motorhead, which was a great tour, you know? And uh, he's like, do you, have you spent much time in Europe? I'm like, are you kidding me? Every summer for the last 20 years, I spent six or eight weeks there. I got bus contacts, hotel contacts, travel agents. And all. I, I'm like, yeah. So I get a copy of the dates and I'd been to all of these cities and all of these uh, venues. So it, it became a natural. So at that point I started advancing the European date and buying tickets. And so, and that turned into 13 years with her. And, um, yeah, now I'm the tour coordinator. Um, as of like, uh, uh, 2019, the middle of 2019, um, uh, I lost my dad, uh, before that and had kind of made a decision to come off the road and, uh, they offered me a position of, of court, tour coordinator where I don't have to go out and do all the shows, um, travel as much. So I hired a great tour manager out of Nashville, Kevin Stoll. So he and I work hand in hand and I'll go out and do, you know, the, the, the dates in the bigger markets, New York's Miami, LA, things like that, or television stuff. But the, um, the, the casinos in Omaha, I don't have to do anymore. So now she's about to do, uh, I think I read light of day. She's about to do uh, a performance for some kind of festival uh, coming up. Do you, yeah. um, do uh, you, are, are you booking? Things? Yeah. Yeah. Michael J. Fox. Yeah. 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 Her and Michael J. are big buddies uh, since they did the movie back, I think in 87, mm-hmm. 88. Um, 
And Bruce Springsteen wrote that tune, by the way, The Light of Day. And um, so they're big buddies. Um, and anytime um, we can, and Michael J has a benefit uh, or a, uh, a fundraiser or stuff like that. We played probably three or four shows with Michael at his house and at, at, at specific venues uh, to try to raise money for the Parkinson Foundation. So Joan is very generous with her time when it comes to to Michael J and his uh, his endeavors uh, towards Parkinson's. Yeah. So um, you you might have to think a second about this, but I'm curious. You've had such a, a fascinating life. What are three like pinch me moments where you thought I cannot believe I'm getting to observe this moment? Um, the Who tour uh, with Roger. And Pete, Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey, we did, um, I got several of those moments. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy and uh, fortunate to say, but um, that, that was definitely a pinch me moment um, to be on. Um, they, they have a, 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 a thing called teen, uh, teen Cancer, Teen Cancer America that they do a lot for. That's their pet project is, uh, and there's a story behind it with regards to a teenager in their life that died of cancer, which really, uh, you know, motivates uh, Pete and Roger both. So um, in 2017, we did, uh, we uh, toured with The Who. And uh, once we became a part of that kind of family, once out on the road, they, on, on, say, we would have three days off in between dates and we would be in Chicago and, uh, or, or in New York or Philly um, and Chicago and Philadelphia specifically, we did teen cancer America shows. And so Roger and Pete would come in and they would bring kind of a core rhythm section in and Joan would do it. She would come in and do like three tunes, but then uh, Bruce Springsteen would come in and, and do uh, three tunes Um uh, the guy from the Eagles, uh, the guitar player from the Eagles. Um, shoot, I can't even remember his name. But <clears throat> they would bring people like that in and do these these dates. But when Bruce came in um, into Philadelphia and on stage, it was uh, Bruce, Joan, Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey, and... Um, the guy from the Eagles, um, I, I that that to me was a real pinch me moment. Yeah. Um, I guess the second one was also <clears throat> in 2017 um, when I was backstage with Joan, <clears throat> and this is the the last segment in the documentary. <clears throat> this was the last scene in the documentary. Uh, called Bad Reputation um, that, that came out in uh, 18. <clears throat> it was uh, Joan and I were standing backstage right before the curtain came up to the audience when they inducted Joan into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And she, and we're, and there's this moment of silence and we have just this look at each other and, and, you know, there's no words that you really have to say at that point. The curtain comes up, the lights come on, and she walks right through the band. And I walk over to the side of the stage, and they introduce her as the newest member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So that was that was very much a, t a touching moment in my life. <clears throat> and um, I guess the last one I'll, I'll share is... Uh, one of my first meetings, uh, first tours with Maynard's Band in 1982, we were doing the uh, cool jazz festivals. Cool cigarettes back then in 82 used to sponsor the jazz festivals. You know, and, and I mean, what a contradiction it is, you know, because the majority of jazz players are horn players, you know. These guys don't smoke cigarettes anymore, you know. Maybe back in the 50s or whatever, but... uh so we, we did um, these uh, cool jazz festivals. We were in Saratoga, New York, 
and we were on the, the, the bill with Count Basie's band, the great Count Basie. And, and, um, and Maynard asked me, he says, uh, do you know where Bill's dressing room is? I'm like, Bill who? <laughs> he was like, Bill Basie, Count Basie. And I was like, okay, I'll find it. So, um, so I did. And, and I went back and told him where it was. He says, come on, let's go, let's go say hello. And, uh, he knocks on the door, sticks his head in and walks in. And I'm like three weeks out of school at this point. And I'm standing in the room with Maynard and Count Basie and, and uh, Count could not have been more lovely. And uh, that, that as a young kid right out of school, that, that was a pinnacle moment. It's like, wow. You know, at that point I'm just like, keep your mouth shut, keep your eyes and your ears open and keep this gig. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much what I say every day. <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, one thing, one thing that I love about you is that you have achieved great success, but yet you have not forgotten from whence you came. And so you've reached back and you uh, have a lot of really great work that you do with uh, the University of Tennessee at Martin. Uh, tell me a little bit about some of the things you have going on with them. Well, one, I've had the opportunity through the years to go back even after the first couple of tours with Maynard, um, I would go back and uh, speak to the kids. Um, then they started calling them master classes, but they had a four o'clock afternoon recital time that, uh, you know, when I was there, that was a student recital time. Well, I would come back on, on the Tuesdays and I would just tell them about the tour. I would tell them about the last tour I got on and do, you know, um, who who are we touring with some of the people, you know, some of the places that we went, some of the people that we played with um, and, and answer questions for the kids. Then it become more of a structured um, part of the, the program where I would come back in and, and I would bring like slide presentations and things like that and, and become more involved because I mean, there is no, there is no book and there, there is no format to teach things like tour management. Um, it, there, it, it just doesn't exist even in the, the great music programs that are out at, at places like Belmont College and North Texas State University, University of Ohio, that has great music production classes. The, the practical application of being a tour manager is rolling up your sleeves and getting in there and doing it. So what what I basically tried to do with the, the students at UTM is I would go back year to year to year, year after year after year, is to basically let them know that it's really okay to fly by the seat of your pants if A, when you have success, you don't wear your arm out patting yourself on the back and B, when you have failures, that you don't wear your foot out kicking your butt. Get in there and mix it up and give it your best shot. And if things go sideways, figure it out. You know, but that, that and, and what I wanted to, tip, you know, to, to get across to them was that's kind of the way life is. You know, enjoy this time at UTM. It's your best days. You know, it's your most carefree days because once you get out into the real world, it is the real world. And, you, you know, especially if you start a family, you're that that's what you have. You, you know, your your responsibility level increases, but figure it out. You know um, what I've got going on there now. Um, the, the the I mentioned Stan Mark earlier. Stan was the lead trumpet player for Maynard Ferguson. He came in. He and I hit it off. He was the one that that made the call and got me out on the road. That was a pinnacle point in my career is having a mentor like that through that guest artist series at UTM. So through the years, I always tried to contribute my time and my finances that they could bring people in um, that these students could hear outside of the box, you know, outside of, of, of just great local talent, of course. But, you know, I think it's important for them to hear 
world musicians, world-class musicians, but world music, music from other countries, dance from other countries, and things like that. So I always tried to be a, a financial contributor um, and, and, and turn them on to people that I'd run across in my travels out on the road. And, um, and then last year, became more involved as they named the guest artist series uh, after me. And then I became obviously a bigger part of uh, that booking. And, and, and I have the opportunity to work with Dr. Julie Hill, who I think is just an amazing person and a, a motivator of people, uh, a great administrator, also a, a, an incredibly talented musician, but an incredible administrator. And as you very well know that, uh, we're up to our eyeballs in trying to put together the Northwest Tennessee Arts Center, which I'm very, very excited about and excited to be on the advisory board with you. Yeah, I think it's going to be really a a, uh, a big deal for this region and getting more arts and getting more performance uh, for the people of uh, Northwest Tennessee. Absolutely. The community, what it's going to be able to bring to our whole community, culturally, financially, exposure wise exposure for the university there's so many check boxes of pluses that that it it really covers to fit the bill that i just i'm so very excited about it because you know when you got a, a 3000 seat auditorium that has appropriate dressing rooms and practice facilities and done right you know we can we can bring in so many different acts from around the world you know we can do broadway shows we can we can catch it and and with this with the same kind of mentality we are in northwest tennessee but within a 500 mile region we have major markets that we can pull from when people you know book shows in nashville we can catch them coming out of nashville atlanta jackson mississippi you know we 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 have access here. We're right in the middle of the country. That's why FedEx is such a great distribution center because we're in the middle of everything. Well, Martin can be too, and it can be a cultural center. I really now, believe. It. Now I know that uh, they call the guest artist series the Ed Sargent guest artist series. Um, what um, obviously COVID has screwed things up. Are y'all already working on twenty? 21, 2022? Yes, 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 we are. <clears throat> because we have hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I truly hope that the world is going to spin right back into orbit. And people I really feel are starved for entertainment. Um, and with Julie, we're, we're, we're booking acts now. We've got to be a little bit cautious um, to go that far down the road with regards to live acts. But uh, we just booked uh, a buddy uh, uh, of mine, uh, Tim Reese, we're working with, who is the saxophone player with the Rolling Stones. He's been with the Rolling Stones for 15 years. And he was on our show, Keeping the Beat, <clears throat> which was the Zoom cast, podcast that we did to keep the students engaged during the height of COVID back last April, May, June, things like that. We had a show, <clears throat> Keeping the Beat, sponsored by uh Tennessee Music Educators Association and also the Country Music Hall of Fame, uh, uh, CMA, Country Music Association. So we had the opportunity to bring actually several of my associates that I've worked with through the years on this program, but it covered a wide variety of music people. But we've got Tim uh, scheduled to, uh, to do a show and also Chuck Lavelle, who is the great piano player that's been with the Rolling Stones for the last 35 years, we just booked him to do a virtual show and Q&A with the students um, uh, as well, which is is a great, um, I, I think is a great end. I love the Rolling Stones, I always have uh, since I was a kid, and to have that, that connection inside, I'm going to use it. Just like, you know, my Billy Joel connection. Carl Fisher is one of the great jazz trumpet players in the world, but he's also he's one of the most high profile trumpet players playing with a band like Billy's. You know, I, I want these these students to be impressed by the, the quality of the talent that they get to hear. And I'm so happy to be able to be a part of bringing it to them. That is what I think the guest artist series is about and what it should be about. 
Yeah, you're you're absolutely living out, you know, the whole mission of Discovery Park of America, which is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. So my last question is going to be, you know, if you had to think of one thing you've discovered that's contributed in a positive way to your life so far, what would that be? Make yourself indispensable. When I came on that road as a kid, I knew what I wanted. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be out there touring with a bunch of musicians, as strange as that may sound. I want to smell the diesel in the morning from the bus. I want to ride 600 miles overnight to the next show. And in doing that, I thought the very best way that I could do that is try my best to make myself indispensable on the road. I wanted to be the next tour manager. I wanted to know everything about that operation in the stage. And I'm taking this completely out of my playbook that I tell these students and have told them that up there for 25 years. You want to keep a gig early is on time and on time is late. Always be on time. You know, be focused when you're going into there, just like musicians are focused going onto the stage. You know, I drove the, 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 the tour bus when I needed to. I was the lighting director and I designed the T-shirts. I also sold them on occasion. So within the, the, the confines of the Mayor Ferguson organization, I wanted to do as much as I could do to try to make myself indispensable as an integral part of the operation. That's what keeps you working. That's what keeps you, you, you know, out on the road. And, and I did it. I never picked up a paycheck for working. I picked up a paycheck for playing, for being out on the road. And, and uh, I, I always thought that it was just amazing that I could have so much fun and travel all around the world, somebody else pay for it, and then get a check at the end of the week. So that, that's what I try to share with the students. And if they can find that passion, I, I promise them the money will follow. Amen, brother. Preach. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure, Scott. Pleasure, man. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com.